From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 187, recorded on August 28th, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent, and hello, Daniel, because I know you're going to say hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm I'm here in uh, I, I'm back in the tri-state area. Uh, <sighs> From being upstate New York, and I'm, I'm enjoying some coffee here in my Parasites Without Borders mug. Oh, look at you! Look at you! Yeah, look but it's you. real coffee. I think on a lot of TV shows, right? They drink water. You know, yeah, I'm, that's I'm true. drinking. I'm drinking. This is a double espresso. Dave Dixon, I have a <laughs> cup. I have a cup for you. See, nice. That's fish oh. on it. Lovely little little, little uh, nautical scheme. That's, I guess fish scheme, right? Water. That's very water. very very thoughtful. <laughs> very thoughtful. <laughs> All right. It's as, it's as close as I've ever been to fish this month, by the way. Well, you know, you you just have to be patient. I do. I have fishing is all about patience. It's true. It is. So is doctoring. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's get right down to business here and talk about last episode's case from Daniel. Ah, yes. Ah, all right. Yes. So let me um let me re- let me remind those of us, those of you, <laughs> those of us tuning back in. <laughs> um, and uh for the first time for those uh coming in for the first time. Um this was a case from TWIP 186 and it was uh a um woman a woman in her I say middle aged. Did I actually say middle aged? I yeah, think you that did was say that. You, you did, did say that. Middle aged. Okay. Um, and she, she had been referred to me, um, quite upset because she's been doing, you know, all the COVID stuff, sheltering at home, um, looking after her children. And one day when she was looking at her children, she noticed a problem with her vision. Um, when she covered her right eye, she noticed that there was an area of loss of vision in her left eye. There were no other associated symptoms. She admitted to the hospital, blood tests, eye exam, um, noted to have a lesion in the back of the eye that had developed. Um, Infectious disease was actually not called at this point, Um, but a bunch of blood work was done, um, did a West Nile virus serology test. Um, They did another serology test that we're going to talk about, Um, and the second serology test came back positive. We did discuss a few things that had been done that were negative, um, there was the toxoplasmosis IgG IgM test had come back negative. Um, when we went through the history, there weren't any exciting exposures. There were no cat, no dog exposures. I don't know if anyone asked about raccoons, but no raccoon exposures either. Um, and prior to this, she had been healthy, no prior medical problems, no surgeries, no toxic habits, not a smoker. Um, HIV status was was not known, but um, she reports to be married in a monogamous relationship. Um, no uh, family history of heart disease or strokes or coronary artery disease or vascular issues. Um, and so here we had it. You know, I forgot to ask you, uh, even though she's been sheltering for, you know, six months or whatever, previous years, did she do any traveling overseas? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, no, she had not. She had not, but that's excellent. Always been here. All right. Daniel, why don't you take the first one? Sydney writes, hello, TWIP. The weather here in Maryland is a very humid 85 degrees today. I recently graduated with my degree in master's in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. I've been listening to TWIP while filling out many job applications. For this week's case study, I think the patient has microsporidiosis. Since the patient has a lesion of the back of the left eye, I read an article on ophthalmic parasitosis from Hindawi. You already ruled out toxoplasmosis and West Nile virus and mentioned that a serology test came back positive. According to the article I read, microsporidiosis is diagnosed through serology testing and is present in the area where the patient lives. Hope you guys are staying safe. Thanks, Sydney. Hmm. Dixon. 
You're muted. I'll shout. <laughs> Anthony writes, greetings, day twippers. I'm writing in once again to provide my guess for case 186, the woman with a retinal lesion. Considering that there is no animal exposure, there really is only one other soil-borne worm in the United States that causes retinal lesioning, the dreaded Bayless ascaris procyonis. If this is indeed the case, not much is known about treatment, but albendazole and an oral steroid are what seem to be recommended. Hope I got this one right, Anthony S. Hmm. Morgan writes, Dear Twip, here goes my guest for Twip 186. I am a medical laboratory scientist currently in Houston, Texas, where it's hot and humid. I work in a histocompatibility lab, but I've held an interest in parasitology and infectious disease since my previous work in molecular microbiology and my parasitology class at the University of Washington in Seattle. Thank you for the podcast. Initially, when I think of parasites in eyes, I think of Oncocercovolvulus, Loa Loa, or Acanthamoeba. However, most of these don't fit with geography excluding acanthamoeba or with the diagnostic method. Serology, after consulting CDC's list of antibody detection tests for parasitic diseases, I excluded everything but Toxocara canis and see that the clinical picture fits. Her unilateral vision impairment is descriptive of ocular visceral migraines. Perhaps she ate some infective eggs that snuck into her garden's edible plants. Daniel. Wyatt writes, hello again, Twip Troubadours. It is Wyatt again, however, this time writing from sunny California. The highs have been in the low hundreds for the past week and showed no signs of letting up. I have now begun at Loma Linda and have been learning lots, though nothing about parasites yet. I guess anatomy and biochemistry will have to hold me over until then. In regards to the guests for this month, the first thought that came to my mind was, Larva migrans, ocular larva migrans, OLM. This condition occurs often when there is a zoonotic transmission of a parasite. Similarly to how we believe COVID arose, a zoonotic transmission comes from an animal host population to a human. The parasite attempts to find the right structure to reside in and ends up causing accidental harm to the human by wriggling around where they should not. Occasionally, the parasite Toxicara canis can cause eye impairment in humans. This is a dog hookworm, and since the patient has been working in the dessert in the dirt, she may have I shouldn't say dessert. <laughs> she <laughs> may have inadvertently picked up an egg fecal oral route. However, Dr. Daniel said that she has not been near any pets. This does not mean that a dog never did use the facilities amongst her daffodils, but we will explore other options. Another option would have been Toxoplasma gondii, which is again transmitted by fecal oral consumption of the oocysts, though this time from cat feces, these pesky pets and their parasitic propulsions. This, however, is rarely problematic unless the host is immunocompromised or pregnant or, or so given her normal health, I do not think it would be these. Other parasites that cause eye issues are often found in Africa, such as the parasite that can cause river blindness. Finally, I came across an amoeba, which is my final answer, called acanthamoeba. This amoeba can cause keratitis when it comes in contact with the eye and gets under the contact. Usually, this only affects immunocompromised patients as well, but contact wearers can be susceptible also. This parasite often can cause granulomatous amoebic encephalitis as well. However, keratitis can be picked up by unfiltered tap water or by the soil. It would cause pain and a lesion to the affected eye. To treat, unfortunately, this parasite is a tough one. The best options are topical myconazole, propanamidine, and neosporin. Hopefully this month my answer was more on target, and thanks for the interesting case, Wyatt. Dixon. Ian writes, greetings esteemed doctors. I am just a student at a small university in Mishawaka, Indiana, about to start my final semester of undergrad. I took a microbiology course my second year at college and have ever since fallen in love with all things infectious. I love all of your podcasts, and I want to thank you for spending your time providing such a useful and valuable resource. 
I wanted to try and make a guess about the case study for TWIP 186 about the middle-aged woman with an ocular disturbance. My th first thought was toxoplasmosis. However, Dr. Griffin ruled that one out for us. I did some Googling about ocular uh, eukaryotic parasites and found this open access article created by two medical parasitologists in India. After hunting through this article, which I found fascinating, I think the patient had ocular toxicoriasis. Toxicoriasis is caused by Toxicara canis and Toxicara cati, nematodes with dogs and cats respectively, as their definitive host. Toxicoriasis is acquired by the ingestion of the nematode's eggs and the migration of the hatched larva outside of the digestive tract into other tissues. The above article mentions a posterior granuloma as a potential manifestation of ocular toxicoriasis, and as Dr. Depamier mentioned, granulomatous, granulomas while developing his differential diagnosis, I think that it could, I could be on the right track, unless Dr. Depamier was also not on the right track. <clears throat> Hmm. Thank you for all that you do, and your podcasts are one of the few things keeping me sane during this time of physical distancing and needless public politicizing of basic public health measures. Thanks again, and stay healthy. Stan, and he's an international health major, biology, and Spanish minor. That's a good combination, actually, I think. David writes, dear hosts. Greetings from sunny North Grafton, Massachusetts. I'm going to venture a guess that the patient from 186 is suffering a case of ocular larva migrants caused by a wayward larva toxocara canis. According to papers found on PubMed, toxoplasma is the most common cause of infectious retinitis. It's possible uh, the toxoplasma serology tests were a false negative, but after devoting many months to learning the ins and outs of Toxocariasis for my qualifying exam, I will stink to my guns, even if I'm wrong. While Dr. Griffin mentioned there were no dog or cat exposures, it's possible she or her kids may have come into contact with infective eggs at some point, gardening or in a park, before COVID sheltering took place. And in regards to a point that Dixon mentioned, the remnants of the cause of a parasitic lesion may have long passed since the infection began only to leave the lesion in its wake. May be necessary to also check on the children for signs of toxicoriasis, as they may have also accidentally uh, ingested infective eggs. Although with increased hygienic practices due to COVID, it's possible that only their mother was unlucky enough to be infected. Thank you once again for the podcasts, Daniel. <clears throat> Rebecca writes, "Yeah, you know, I'm hoping that after COVID, people continue to wash their hands and practice good hygiene. But you know, that's just me." Uh, dear Twip, hello from Baltimore, where it's 29C and 73% humidity. I like to listen to your old episodes while cooking. That way, no one knows whether I'm crying from cutting onions or from Dixon's powerful storytelling. <laughs> Sounds to me like Daniel's patient has ocular larva migrans caused by Toxicara. Maybe there are some paratenic hosts hanging out in her garden. Bunnies or the neighborhood cats are using her mulch as a litter box. OLM can manifest unilaterally, most commonly as a whitish granuloma, since serum relies alone for OLM is not reliably sensitive. Thanks, Dixon. One can attempt to compare serum antibody levels with intraocular fluid antibody level for a more definitive diagnosis. Whether treatment with a anti-helminthic is warranted seems to lack major consensus. Albendazole BID at varying doses to knock out the larvae taken with food or grapefruit juice to improve absorption. Finally, a med you should take with grapefruit juice. <laughs> Systemic or ophthalmic prednisolone is if actively inflamed, surgical intervention for some complications, but overall, it seems like vision damage is often irreversible. Here's something interesting I came across. Apparently, a unique feature of OLM is that in some patients, the granuloma can actually migrate. I suppose because the larva itself is migrating across the eye. Incredibly fascinating for the clinician scientist, but no doubt unpleasant for the patient, as most things in medicine are. Thanks again for another great episode. Take care, Rebecca. And she actually has like a whole bunch of uh, references. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Dixon. Yes, sir. Coming up. Dorothy, uh, Deborah, I'm sorry, Deborah writes, you didn't say if the patient was Jewish or not. 
<laughs> if not, perhaps cystic cirrhosis due to tinea solium from undercooked pork. If the ELISA test is positive, and since treatment killing the cyst causes more inflammation, the best treatment is surgery. This was the first of your podcasts I listened to. Haven't thought of this field since I took it at UCLA from Dr. Mack, although my partner has worked on a vaccine for malaria at NIH. Deborah. Hey, Dixon. So, you know, since people like your stories, maybe now's the time to tell a good story why you can be Jewish and still get cystocercosis? Well, if you want to divert, I would be happy to, but uh, we have a lot of other choices to read here. But just, just in brief, there was a big outbreak of uh, cystocercosis on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, which is a predominantly um, Orthodox Jewish community for the most part. And uh, none of them admitted to eating pork. But as it turned out, one of them had hired a housekeeper from a little town in northern Mexico and it turns out that the housekeeper uh, harbored adult, an adult tapeworm of tinea solium. And because she was so good, uh, the uh, neighbors asked, well, where did she come from? We'd like to hire some people. Maybe she has relatives. And of course, they all uh, gave her reference. And the reference came back to this little town in northern Mexico. And next thing you know, we had a community of people from the same town working on Ocean Parkway. And seven people in different houses, different ages, different both sexes caught this um, larval form of the uh, the adult tapeworm from the fact that the housekeepers in all those places um, would make the food for the family. They would do the cooking, they would make salads, uh, and they, they were trying to be hygienic, I'm sure. But as it turned out later, uh, they could find virtually every part of the body of these people covered with tinea solium eggs. So it's very difficult to um, account for uh, good hygiene in this case, because the tapeworm proglottids from the adults actually migrate out of the body and contaminate sheets and um, various other fomites. And, and, you, and you can have these eggs spread quite quickly this way. So that's, that's an unusual story that involved a, a Jewish community that uh, didn't acquire the infection through the normal route. Is that the one you were referring to? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, because I think it's important for people to know that, you know, if you eat the undercooked pork, you get the tapeworm, not right. the sister sarcosis. Exactly if you right. eat the eggs, you yes. get the sister sarcosis. So there you, go. Um, you got it. That's All right. A, that is on an old TWIP episode. You told that story. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. But it's Carol, always good to tell them. The Carol end. writes, good afternoon from sunny upstate New York, where it's a beautiful 27 Celsius. Since listening to you for the second time, it appears that you like to hear about the weather. <laughs> so I thought I would contribute. This case is somewhat of a brain teaser. I definitely had some particular parasites in mind when first hearing the symptoms. Eye infestations make me think of... Filarial disease is not common in the U.S. like Loa Loa. Since the patient had not traveled any time in the relatively recent past, I ruled those typical parasites out. My thoughts are based on my knowledge of lab testing. Which parasites found in the U.S. can serological testing be performed on? Giardia, Toxoplasma, Toxocara, Trichinella, various tapeworms. What might this patient have been exposed through, animals or food? Since she had no known exposure to cats and the toxoplasma serology was negative, rules that out. Although if she were gardening or doing yard work, it's possible she had unknown contact with cat or dog feces, making a toxocara retinal lesion possible via migrating larvae. An ocular lesion is not the typical first symptom of giardiasis, and no foamy malodorous stools with gas and bloating were noted in the patient. So, no giardia. What's left? Trichinella and tapeworms. Trichinella larvae usually insist in striated muscle tissue and may find their way to the eye. The patient in this case would exhibit periorbital edema, which was not noted on exam. A clouding of vision could occur if the worm insisted in the retinal tissue. Same thing with the tapeworm tinea solium. The larval stage can cause cystocercosis and can insist in any tissue. This parasite tends to have a special affinity for brain tissue, though, making it less likely in this case. So I want to narrow down my choice of parasite to either Toxocara or Trichinella. Since Trichinella comes from undercooked pork and meat production in the U.S. has decreased the incidence of this parasite, I think the parasite is the least likely choice of the two. My final answer is going to be Toxocariasis caused by accidental ingestion of toxocara species in contaminated soil since the parasite can be detected by EIA 
methods using either serum or vitreous fluids at the CDC. According to my reference, the drug of choice would be diethylcarbamazine, which is used in the treatment of filarial infections. It tends to be widely distributed, well-absorbed, reaching peak concentrations within three hours, and would be able to reach the retinal tissue. Thanks again for keeping my brain active in lab diagnosis during my summer break-in classes. Can't wait for the next one, Carol. All right, Jody writes, Hi, Vincent, Daniel, and Dixon. Greetings from sunny Seattle, where we reached 99 degrees F this week for perhaps only the 10th time in 130 years. That is crazy. Oops, sorry about that. I'm. Can you believe that I'm being paged? So I'll just turn this off. No, it's a, you're you're a needed guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so greetings from sunny Seattle, where we reached. Oh, this weekend while drinking gin at a safe distance and enjoying the effects of climate change. Some friends and I began <laughs> speculating that now is probably the time to start shopping for outdoor patio heaters as we are perhaps only a month away from the time when it's going to suddenly be a lot less comfortable to meet up with friends in the outdoors. And at the end of September, all of the patio heaters will likely be off the shelves, just like the fans all disappear the first week we hit the sweltering upper 60s around here. On to the patient Daniel has seen the previous Tuesday before recording TWIP 186. She was a woman in her middle years, sheltering at home in the Long Island area, who had noticed an area of loss of vision in her left eye. From Daniel's report, she was feeling well physically, but was quite distraught due to this ophthalmic development, and likely also due to the trauma of being at least temporarily a medical mystery. (laughs) West Nile and toxoplasmosis serology tests were negative, but an eye exam revealed a lesion in the back of the left eye, and Daniel confirmed that one serology test came back positive, and he subsequently recommended a retinal specialist for her to see next. According to PD 6th edition, toxocariasis may be the most common helminth infection in the United States after pinworm with visceral larva migraines and ocular larva migraines stated as two conditions typically caused by toxicaricanus T. cati. Ocular toxocariasis was first associated with dogs in the 1940s and human infection was first documented by Helenor Wilder in 1950 when she discovered a larvae within a retinal granuloma of a child. As you all mentioned, a granulum is a lesion that is resolved, a structure formed by prior inflammation, but a remnant of what caused that inflammation can sometimes still be visualized upon exam. I found a paper in PLOS Neglected Diseases, Neglected Tropical Diseases, about the contamination of public spaces in New York City, apparently through microscopy and qPCR. The authors found significant levels of contaminations of all five boroughs, with the Bronx having the highest contamination rate of 66.7%. The authors speculate that feral and untreated cats represent a significant source of environmental contamination. I am unsure, however, as to whether a litter box might present a hazard for the Long Island dweller, as in the case of Toxoplasma gondii. The adult Toxocara live in the intestines of dogs and cats, and eggs are passed through their feces. Humans, usually the smaller ones who play in sandboxes and playgrounds and stick their filthy hands in their mouths, inadvertently ingest the eggs after they've embryonated in soil. Larvae hatch in the small intestine, penetrate the wall, then migrate around the body to various organs via the bloodstream, with popular destinations being the eye, the CNS, and the liver. Diagnosis can be done via ELISA or RIA, radio, radio immunoassay. And treatment may include albendazole in conjunction with corticosteroids as well as surgery, which could explain Daniel calling in the retinal specialist. Another contender is acanthamoeba, a free-living amoeba found worldwide in water and soil that can be acquired due to contaminated contact lens solution or lenses routinely washed in unfiltered tap water. Infection with acanthamoeba has been on the rise due to an increase in immunocompromised patients and contact lens wearers. The authors of PD6 state that almost all humans encounter this organism at some point in their lives, but it seems very few people will become sick. Acanthamoeba keratitis is an infection of the eye that occurs in healthy persons and can result in permanent visual impairment. Acanthamoeba has only two stages in its life cycle, cysts 
and trophozoites. And both can enter humans in various ways, through the eye, through nasal passages, and through broken skin. The NIH states that it's quite rare for the amoeba to spread from the cornea to the retina, so my money isn't on this critter. I'm going with toxocariasis. I was tickled to get my first diagnosis attempt correct last month, and my mom listened to that twip and called me right afterwards. I swear she sounded prouder of me <laughs> than she was when I graduated from high school or college. Here's hoping throwing my name in the hat gets me a signed book this time. Take care. Stay well. Stay grumpy. Thanks for all you do, Jody. <laughs> nice. Hey. Amanda writes, greetings. I was torn between toxicoriasis or tinea solium. I'm going with toxicoriasis, T. canis, and T. cati. Amanda. Wow, that was short and sweet. I could read the next one if Go you Go ahead. Go right ahead. Andrew writes, Keora from Pangorora. And by the way, Keora means stay healthy. So it is an appropriate greeting for the current times. No book one yet. Have the movie rights been sold yet? Hmm, I wish. <laughs> COVID-19, just a little bit of a diversion, but it's worth it. As you, will, as, you, as you will know, we have gone from a handful to over 100 active cases with a new cluster over the last 102 days when we had no community transmission. New Zealand achieved a fair level of herd complacency. We were not allowing ourselves to be tested in sufficient numbers so that when the in inevitable case got past the border controls, it could easily be picked up. We were not using the government supplied app that allowed us to keep a diary of where we went and to whom we had encountered in sufficient numbers to assist contact tracing efforts. Now the app is being downloaded apace and the testing stations are nearly overwhelmed. The border restrictions and isolation facilities here were put together in a rather ad hoc manner. Various government departments and private enterprises were cobbled together to as quickly as possible and with inadequate communication between the different parts. So when the virus took hold in a community cluster, the officials and public were taken by surprise. The scientists, not so much. However, the situation seems to be brought under control with capable test and trace teams. The weakness in the border containment operation result from a general lack of preparedness for a non-influenza pandemic, in my non-professional opinion. We are coming up to an election, and the various political parties are presenting border policies that range from the ridiculous self-isolation in an Airbnb apartments and the scary confining all people arriving in the country in military compounds, an interesting example of a case transmission in an isolation unit most likely happened when a maintenance worker used a lift minutes after a positive tested person had traveled in it. The question is whether droplets and aerosols were concentrated in the air on a fomite in the elevator car in an amount to allow for infection in a shorter period time frame than 15 minutes. Another possibility is that she might have shed virus in the form of aerosolized fomites. And there's a reference for that possibility from hair or clothes if she shook out long hair or donned a coat, etc. In any case, it emphasizes the wisdom of using masks in confined spaces alone or not. If you guys ever expand Twimp Empire to include this week in epidemiology with or without case studies, I will be your first subscriber. It's not a bad idea. <clears throat> the case of the woman with the loss of vision in her left eye. New York is now classified as a humid subtropical climate zone. <laughs> as the climate changes, so will the range of parasites. But I don't think we need to worry about river blindness becoming endemic in New York just yet. Parasites that cause ocular larval migraines in the U.S. are, according to PD7, are mostly toxic hurricanes and T. cati. She might be reporting no contact with pets, but can her children say the same? I have been taught I have been caught only twice now implicitly trusting negative test results, so I am not going to get caught out by assuming that no pets in the house does not mean that it is free from animal feces. PD7 mentions playgrounds and sandboxes and even lockdown kids need to play and animals exercised, so my guess is toxicoriasis. Nagamihi. Andrew. Interesting story in... Uh yeah. There, huh? yeah, 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 absolutely. Cecilia writes, I believe your patient with vision loss is suffering from focal retinochorioiditis caused by toxogondi. The diagnosis was made 
by demonstration of lesions in the eye as well as antibody tests. I thought they were negative. <laughs> That's okay. They were negative. That's okay. <laughs> there are many sources of infection, so from the information given, it's hard to say where she acquired the parasite, most likely been treated with pyru pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. I was able to speak with an infectious disease pediatrician who treated a patient with ocular toxo. His patient was treated for a year with the above drugs and also folinic acid to prevent anemia, which is a side effect of those drugs. Aside from the above source, I got my information from PD7, CDC, PubMed, and the Review of Ophthalmology. Thanks very much. Stay well. St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, gentlemen, James before you go James. on, I just want to warn you. Yeah. Um, we're a, a thunderstorm is rolling over us, and so it is possible that uh, we nice. will become disconnected. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> we better cut to the chase. It sounds it sounds so ominous. <laughs> we might well, become disconnected. It can be severe. We had a neat one that went through last night. There was a flash of lightning almost every second. Really? Wow. Yeah, but it was intercloud lightning, so you didn't actually get the thunder part of it. But it was really quite dramatic. Okay. Well, if you if you lose us, you know, and we lose you, then we'll try to connect. Back. <laughs> yeah, we'll try. Do you want to ex do you want to excerpt each one of these that follows? No, no, you can go ahead. No, it's no, fine. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get okay. lucky. We're gonna get right. lucky. <laughs> Here we go. James writes. So I thought of several things immediately from my background as a pathologist in a bone marrow transplant hospital in Denver. Candida, a fungus, toxoplasmosis, and CMV, a virus, the kind that sometimes makes you sick. These are usually in significantly immunocompromised patients. Any of these can cause a localized retinitis infarction. Then I remembered my time in an eye hospital, mostly looking at corneas and basal cells of eyelids and thought of a amoeba, especially if she wears contact lenses, but that's usually in the front of the eye, not the back. Lots of fungi can also infect the cornea, especially with microtrauma, dust, exposure. I actually have done several three-hour lectures on eye pathology for my current medical school. There's not much as disturbing as a bunch of sick eyes staring at you in a lecture. <laughs> Since then, it's TWIP. I cast an even broader net and went to Google, found a pretty good review article on fungal and parasitic eye infections. Uh, this led to some interesting possibilities. Chagas can do it, although more more commonly causes periorbital swelling, Romagna sign. Giardia of all things can cause ocular symptoms, but probably by setting up some kind of autoimmune or allergic reaction, not by actually infecting the eye. Reminded me of sympathetic ophthalmia, a rare condition that causes the second eye to be attacked by T cells after the first eye is injured. Monsieur Brayel was a victim. Malaria can block capillaries anywhere. History is not great, I suppose. I, I think that was a comment about her history, not just history is not great. I suppose malaria can do it. Then so could a nasty case of Babesia. Dirofilaria imitis could block a retinal artery. Most of the ones I saw, it was in the lung. Nathostomia is on the list. Where zebra, though, never saw, recognized it. Cystocercosis can lodge anywhere, including the eye. Most of the cases I saw were brain biopsies, and everyone was actually relieved to have something treatable. You could certainly see it with an ophthalmoscope. Don't know about serology. Toxic hurricanus and echinococcus are also on the list. Oncocerca and lower lower, I think, are usually more anterior chamber, even cornea. I suppose I have to favor toxoplasmosis in a Yankee and wonder if she might have some underlying condition that is suppressing her, like a Hodgkin or other lymphoma, or maybe even a sneaky HIV. James M. Small, MD, PhD, FCAP. Dixon, you're muted again. I just unmuted. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll, you'll thank me in the long run. <clears throat> Elsie writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, I hope this finds all of you well and comfortable. It is currently 90 degrees F, 32.2 degrees C, and super sticky here in lower Manhattan, and the wind seems to be picking up a bit. Again, I really appreciate you to continue to do TWIP in spite of the near-constant barrage of fascinating virology-based information, news, scandal, stories, and intrigue that appears on even my non-scientist-centric -centric news radar daily. 
My diagnostic guess for the patient Dr. Griffin described in TWIP 186 is that she has managed to find herself with ocular toxicoriasis. I admit that some of my diagnosis comes from process of elimination, since her location on Long Island, combined with her sheltering in and not receiving guests from afar, rules out many of the more far-flung parasites that can take up residence in the eye. Also, I saw from the description that she was tested for toxoplasmosis and that the result was negative. It was very, or you, did you just get hit by lightning? <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was very kind to rule out one of the local parasites from the outset. In this case, the woman's symptoms and the discovery of the granuloma on her retina pointed towards ocular toxicoriasis. While she still doesn't have a dog or cat that is, tip, that is a typical source for exposure, she has been outside doing a bit of gardening in Long Island where there are roaming foxes and that or a wayward outdoor cat could have been the source of the infection. Everything I have read suggests that ocular toxicoriasis is usually an infection which children and people with pet cats and dogs and and most suscept are more susceptible. But I wonder if she perhaps was just unlucky and failed to wash her hands super thoroughly after gardening. I am guessing that the secret serology test that was done that confirmed the diagnosis was the ELISA test. How did you treat the patient? Did the patient need to have the lesion physically removed? Will her vision be permanently impacted? As always, I can't tell you how grateful I am to all of you for everything you do and for your creation of this community. It means a lot when so many other things are suspended. Best wishes, Elsie. Hmm. Owen writes. Or Elise. That's Elise. Elise, I'm sorry. of course. Been, I have been mispronouncing your name. Elise. Elise, I, I yeah, yeah. I apologize. Owen writes, Dear Twip, I hope my case this month is not too late. I'm very remiss. Having initially jumped to toxoplasma, I was very sad when Daniel said the serology was negative. However, an ocular lesion with a confirmatory serological test made me think of two differentials, either ocular larva migrans due to toxicaricanus or cati, or ocular cysticercosis due to tenius oleum. Lack of cat or dog exposure makes the former less likely— but given the lack of other lesions or brain on brain imaging, I'm going to plump for it anyway. She'd have to be very unlucky to have cystocerci only end up in the eye and nowhere else, although I suppose anything is possible. Look forward to hearing the correct an answer. Thanks as ever for all you do. Daniel. All right. You know, I usually count ahead because the way I look at TWIP is that, you know, our emailers do all the work for us, but reading Kevin's email is work. <laughs> so, but I will say it is, it is a labor of love. I'm always entertained by Kevin's contribution. So Kevin writes, Granny's granuloma are getting down to the nitty gritty. The entire topic of granuloma begets a lot of confusion. It stems from the Latin granulum, little grain. It doesn't help that there are many similar medical terms, such as granulation tissue, pyogenic granuloma, and granuloma inguinalic. I would like to digress earlier than normal and advertise my aversion to the trendy term granular, which is trying to displace the humble word detailed. I lament the disuse of the old 70s locution that the nitty gritty, which is much punchier than granular. Yeah. The term granuloma was first used by Virchow, Virchow in the 1860s. The 1888 new Sindenheim lexicon defines granuloma as certain neoplasms which generally do not advance in structure beyond the stage of granulation tissue and which usually proceed to ulceration. Under this head, he included syphilitic gumata, lupus, elephantiasis, graecorum, farsi, and glanders, which others have added tubercle, yaws, and actinomyces, actinomycosis. Elephantiasis graecorum is a Roman term for leprosy, not to be confused with Elephantiasis arabum. As you can see, Virchow's, Virchow's original definition has no relevance for our case. It's Virchow. 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 Thank you for jumping. Because I knew I was doing something wrong there. So I appreciate that. Um, for our purposes, the pathology definition of granuloma refers to a an organized collection of macrophages seen in histological preparations under the microscope. Bad to have in the retina. You want rods and cones, not immune cells back there. 
<laughs> there are not many parasites that cause retinal granulomas, or do you say granulomata? Latin and Greek plurals are so last season. I think that our patient is afflicted with the same disease as the child discussed in TWIP 170, May 8th, 2019. A worm's eye view. Though toxic care is usually a pediatric problem, there are numerous case series of affected adults. Um, and then he gives a reference. The diagnosis was made by toxic care antibody detection, ELISA, combined with serum IgE levels. Note that An's first reference is to a review by Dr. De Pommier. Mm-hmm. Did, I get, did I pronounce that right? Childhood ocular <laughs> <laughs> like Close, you're close. You're close. <laughs> it's usually acquired <laughs> by ingestion of embryonated eggs, geophagy, but presumably the adult is infected through ingestion of undercooked or raw meat. I'm assuming that larvae are ingested in these cases, but the literature glosses over the exact biology of transmission in adult ocular larva migrants. Treatment is usually with a combination of albendazole and prednisone, and I am not aware of any large trials that clearly support the customary treatment regimens. Differential diagnosis is fairly wide and is outlined in the end notes. In ON's case series, 38% of cases improved or resolved with treatment, so there's hope for our patient. I remain amazed that your coronavirus transmission schedule has not tapped you all dry and that you have some remaining vital sap to broadcast the TWIP. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> all right. So anything in the end notes we should hit on, Vincent? Uh, why don't you read a terminal curiosity, the last part? Okay. A terminal curiosity. While researching this case, I came across a medical term unfamiliar to me, ocular masquerade, also called masquerade syndrome or uveitis masquerade syndrome. The term was coined in 1967 and is used to refer to disorders that are misdiagnosed as idiopathic chronic uveitis. This term is often associated with intraocular malignancies such as lymphoma. The term has a mysterious poetic ring to it. Primary intraocular lymphoma often poses a diagnostic dilemma with presentations like vitritis, intermediate uveitis, and subretinal plaque-like lesions. Diagnosis is often challenging in such cases, and this is why it is often one of the diseases referred to as a masquerade syndrome. And we get a link to iWiki. Okay. We have one more from University of Central Lancashire Parasitology Club. Hello again from the Parasitology Club in the beautiful northwest of England. After a short break for exams, our club is meeting remotely during the summer recess. We have been considering the likely culprit for Daniel's case of the middle-aged lady sheltering at home, presumably to avoid COVID and distressed when noticing an area of loss of vision in the left eye. She was otherwise asymptomatic. It is unclear for how long she has had this loss of vision, but there appears to have been no acute infectious symptoms. So she may have been living with this for some time. Our binocular view of parasitic suspects for ocular involvement includes acanthamoeba, echinococcus, giardia, gnathostoma, leishmaniasis, malaria, oncocerca, toxocara, toxoplasma, and tinea. Although Daniel said that he was being kind by giving some leading clues and excluding toxa, we found this quite tricky. We excluded nanthosoma, leishmania, oncocerca, and malaria based on geographical distribution of the disease and the assumption of no recent travel history. Giardia was excluded based on the rarity of eye involvement and no other prior symptoms. Acanthamoeba may be acquired from the environment and is more commonly associated with keratitis of the cornea, likely to be a more aggressive and acute infection, and this lady appears to be symptom-free. This leaves us to focus on a handful of zoonotic worms, that are associated with ingestion through contaminated meat or unwashed vegetables or contaminated water resulting in larval migration and complications in the eye. Daniel was specific to mention no cat or dog exposure. So we were tempted to exclude echinococcus and toxocara, and there was discussion on consumption of raw meat, which was also excluded, so this should likely exclude tinea species, leaving us with no suspects in plain sight. Searching through PD-7 with keywords to find more clues, we find that exposure to toxic error does not directly need to involve cat and dog exposure, but ingestion of embryonated eggs that need at least two weeks to mature in soil. 
The parasite is distributed worldwide. Approximately 5% of the U.S. population has evidence of exposure to Toxocara, and infection is usually acquired in childhood through playing in sandboxes and soil contaminated with Toxocara ova. On the balance of probability, we think this lady has a granulomatous lesion in one eye due to ocular larva migrants with Toxocara species. The diagnostic test that Daniel mentions could be an ELISA for antibody to Toxocara larval antigens. Thank you, as always, for your wonderful podcasts and stimulating case studies. We are keeping our fingers crossed for a signed copy of your wonderful book to make the long voyage across the Atlantic to Lancashire. All right. There we go. That's our our list of guesses for this week. And we had, how many did we have? We a had lot. quite a few. We had, well, Kevin doesn't count. He would be number 17 because he's, he's already won one. So that's just true. that's just for the book selection, Kevin. We're not saying that you know. That's right. That's right. 17. We got 17 <laughs> eligible. I think he was the only one not eligible. 17 yeah. guesses and 18 wow. in all. That's pretty good wow. for uh for lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You want a drum roll? Well, you have to you have to guess, Dan uh, Dixon. Oh, that's true. That's true. That is true. Well, Dixon, tell me, tell me your thoughts. Let's hear your thoughts. Well, since I wrote a review on this uh, subject <laughs> some time ago, I must say, but I've always uh, kept it in the fore part of my brain. Since five percent of the United States has evidence of exposure, I believe it is uh, a case of toxic canis or kaitai, depending on. It's uh, impossible to distinguish unless you do a DNA test to see which species it is. But um, it's very likely that she caught this from. Maybe um, even a source of fertilizer that she was applying to the top layer of her garden from a local garden store that collected that from, let's say, a, uh, a turf um, seller that, that raised turf, uh, you know, in their uh, fields and collected the turf and then knocked the dirt out and sold the turf separate from the soil, uh, which we've seen a lot of. And, of course, dogs and cats are wandering all over the place. Uh, especially with lockdown and a lot of cats and dogs are being released from their ownership because they've lost their jobs. They can't afford them. They, there's a lot of reasons why people lose their pets, but uh, it's a sad situation when you see them uh, parking their car along a field and opening the door and that goes the pet dog and the car drives off. But that's a very common yeah. occurrence, by the way. Terrible. So my, 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 it's not a guess. Uh, because I haven't seen the lesion and I haven't seen the ophthalmoscope pattern of what you can see. Uh, and you can probably tell it right like that. But I would say toxic caracanus. That's my guess. All right, Vincent. So I thought of all the worms that, that have been mentioned and, you know, eliminated most of them be, for geographic reasons, obviously. And that left me with um, acanthamoeba and uh, toxicara migrants. Right. Right, right. And I didn't know how to distinguish between the two, but then I read here, and so I would have said both, but I, then I read that the, the, the canthamoeba doesn't migrate often right. to the back of the eyes, that what it was written, so, really. you know, that would rule it out, but that's as far as I got. Well, you got pretty far. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, so yeah, this is in line with, so the Toxicara species antibody, the IgG came back positive. Um, as mentioned, the other serologies were negative. I had her see a retinal specialist and I even did a few other tests as well. So um, the few other tests as well, I'll start with. So, you know, you want to make sure, right? You don't want to say, oh, this is just Toxicara. And then it's some sort of a, a, you know, embolic lesion, right? In the back of the eye. And so we looked at the carotids, we scanned her brain. We made sure that there was no, you know, sort of other explanation as well. Now, the um, retinal specialist um, basically visualized a small lesion in the retina. Um, and I know about a year ago, we, we actually had a tropical medicine specialist ophthalmologist when I was down in Panama, who actually, oh, wow. you know, that was pretty cool, I have to yeah, say, sure. um, you know, who really was like, you know, hey, this is exactly, I'm seeing, you know, a little bit of a larvae, the granuloma. So, you know, we got more of a, there's just a single isolated lesion in the eye, the positive uh, Toxicara species, serology. Um, so this is a presumptive diagnosis with no other obvious sort of compelling explanation. So that, that's what I think this probably is. And uh, right. unfortunately, well, she, she did, as I think we mentioned, she, you know, she got a course of steroids early on that in all honesty may have already been like sort of horse out of the barn type thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
horses are in barns, or horses are cows. What's out of the barn? They get, they're both. They're both. Uh, there. both. <laughs> some, some barn animal out of the barn. The horse has already left the barn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a horse. I got that right. You did. You did. <laughs> my my son was giving me a hard time. We were like late last night before bed. We watched an episode of Stargate and. Um, apparently right. the lead character is about as good as I am with getting his expressions <laughs> correct. So he's like, daddy, he's just like you. He doesn't know any of the expressions. That's good. <laughs> like, That's thank good. you. That's um, so yeah, that was, um, I think that was, uh, so yeah. So that was where I went with this one. All right. So uh, when you looked at the lesion, you didn't see a remnant of the worm. No, and I think that's important. You know, a, a lot of the um, a lot of the descriptions, right? You're hoping, and sometimes you can see, but yeah, not always. Right. Sometimes you're just seeing basically a, a small scar, um, particularly when there's been a period of time. Because a lot of people don't notice this, and then once they do, sure. they thought, "Oh, this is acute." But you know, if the person already has the IgG, if they've already got the scarring, uh, this happened some time ago. So, uh, how was her visual acuity? I mean. So her visual acuity is fine. It's just this one single area where she's basically had damage to the retina. So it's really a loss of visual field in that tiny little zone. But as she moves her eye, you can can see everything else. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Very. All right. Let's, uh, Let's give away a book. Got oh, it. I should say, I should say. Oh, before we go, um, yeah, yeah, I liked a bunch of the things, and one of the things I think is also important is that you don't get this by playing with the dog. The dog, the cat, um, actually defecates the soil. You yeah. know, you need those eggs in the soil for a couple of weeks for them to yeah, exactly, get DNA, exactly. Then the infection. So, yeah, you're you're actually it's going to be the soil exposure, the gardening, things like that that are more important than oh, I have a dog or cat. Exactly. Yeah. All right. right. Rum roll away. <laughs> we have a random number between one and seventeen, and the number is number eight. Deborah. 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 Nice. Deborah's a winner, uh, and uh, <laughs> all of our list? listeners are winners. <laughs> They're every one of them is a winner. <laughs> but you she gets right. a book. Well, you know, the last winner didn't email me, uh, so I don't know if I should proceed down the list but anyway deborah <laughs> uh send me your address twip at microbe.tv uh, but you'll have to wait uh, because we haven't gotten together to sign these things and it will be a while so unfortunately uh, just be patient it's worth the wait meanwhile you can download the seventh edition free for, as a pdf yeah but they want your signature i know we know that. all right what's next on our little uh agenda here we have a paper right actually we, we have, have a paper uh, uh, a paper a paper selected by by uh, Dixon, heme oxygenase he one in protozoan <laughs> infections: a tale of resistance and dele- disease tolerance from PLOS pathogens by yes. Silva Tavassos Pavia and Boza from uh, Brazil. Exactly, Dixon. What is heme oxygenase? It's an enzyme, and it 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 it, it, it aids in the splitting of heme off of hemoglobin. Why would you want to do that? Well, because you want to set, well, it depends. <laughs> if, if you're a malaria parasite, you want to get rid of the heme group because it's toxic. So now, you accumulate. Now, heme oxygenase is, is it something we have in our yes. genome? Yeah, we have two of them, actually. We have a mm. heme oxygenase one, which is an inducible enzyme, as I recall, and the heme oxygenase two, which is constitutive. Mm-hmm. So, in, in light of the infections that occur that use iron, as uh, an, an element that is absolutely necessary for their own biochemistry, they scavenge that from us. And so they uh, depend upon the heme group being released. And of course, it's normally released anyway when a red cell dies. The, the, a lifespan of a red cell is about 120 days. When it dies and it's eaten up by the spleen, the hemoglobin is released. The heme is cleaved off. It's then split up into lots of other things and exits the body as uh, bile pigments, basically. The globin portion is rescavenged because of the amino acids and put back into the pool and to make more hemoglobin back Mm -hmm. in the bone marrow. So these parasites that this group has studied, and I read this very carefully, and I was very, I was absolutely stunned by the lack of parsimony in their biochemistries. That means to me, at least, that what I don't see is a common thread of how all of these parasites uh, incorporate our heme oxygenase one into their biology. In some cases, upregulation of heme oxygenase one 
it favors the parasite. In other cases, when you upregulate it as a result of the infection, uh, the parasite is killed. So you've got these two yin and yang things going on, and they've got four different intracellular parasites that they actually studied. It's sort of a meta-analysis. They actually didn't do much uh, research, but they, they scavenged the literature for everything they could find and uh, came up with this hypothesis as to the importance of heme oxygenase 1 in the biology of these four completely different intracellular parasites, starting with malaria, but also uh, finishing with uh, an indigenous parasite that gives the South Americans much problem in Central America too, namely uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, which is also a, an intracellular parasite. So in no case do, do, does the parasite encode a heme oxygenase. That is correct. That's interesting. You would think they might, right? Since well, at least some of them, the ones that utilize it, right? Yes, but remember, these are all parasites, aren't they? <laughs> so why should they make an enzyme? That yeah, we that's already right. Make? <laughs> it's true. I forgot that part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Like like viruses, they don't encode any proteins that we've got. They use all of them. Well, they have, they have uh, some that they need that that we don't have. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But, so so yeah. I was gonna, I was actually gonna say. So there was there was a publication. I should actually track this down but where they identified hemoxygenase in a plasmodial species. Ah. Ah. Oh. Yeah, so which, you know, if you think about that, makes a little bit of sense. Well, you know, the, the enzyme that cleaves globin from heme, the malaria parasite has that enzyme. So maybe that's the one that I, I, I neglected to call a hemoxygenase one. We usually call it the, um, um, the heme um, no, stacking enzyme. It's called the stacking enzyme. That's okay. right, because once the heme is cleaved, they, they package that into the center of the cell in a very in a crystalline fashion to get rid of it. It's, it's a waste product that it's, in fact, the drug chloroquine inhibits that process mm -hmm. and allows the heme to accumulate in the cytoplasm of the parasite and they die as a result of it. Yeah, so yeah. they have to get rid of heme in order to survive. The other thing though they need to do is to uh, scavenge out that molecule of iron. So that's the reason why we, um, Let's see. I was just, I was diverted in my attentions for the moment. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no. And, and I'll say like, you know, and even when they describe when they, when they isolated the quote unquote heme oxygenase in malaria and the plasmodial species, they're heme oxygenase like, right? Because it's really. Yeah, the exactly. Human exactly. Is the, is the sore. exactly. Exactly. Now, right. the, for the, for the malaria, Dixon. Yes. They they're, require this heme oxygenase to break down the hemoglobin, right? Yeah, you know, they're eating globin. That's their food. And so they depend on heme oxygenase to break it down. The, to they the have to. Right, right. They've got to. Do they induce the its its production? Well, the heme oxygenase one in the mammalian host is an inducible enzyme. So the parasite, mm -hmm. but it's hard to imagine a red cell having an inducible enzyme, isn't it? It is. But, uh, but when the red cell <laughs> breaks, <no> nucleus. <laughs> but when the break red cell breaks, the hemoglobin yes. goes out, and so where can it be broken down? Well, Is, no, the hemoglobin doesn't go out when it releases the out? parasites because the parasites have eaten the globin part to become eight or ten or twelve different okay. parasites. So this what does go out is the uh, the uh, the hemozoan, this yeah. complex of heme groups. So. so the basically the heme oxygenase that's already in the red cell is utilized to break down. That's that's one hemoglobin. possibility, and of course the parasite has a hemoglobin ace, which it uses to chop up the globin once it's cleaved off from the heme group. So it does not have a heme oxygenase, but. Well, I'm speaking out of turn here because if I say it doesn't, some guy's <laughs> going to write in and say, well, we just cloned a gene. Of, no, know, no. I'm not going to, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, we'll say, we'll say some plasmodium have a heme oxygenase like uh, Got it. Okay. protein. Got it. But, Which yeah. must function in the same way. All right. then. So then they, they talk about uh, Chaga, Trypanosoma cruzi. So that's right. What the hell does that have to do with hemo, hemoglobin? <laughs> well, that's a good question because what do they find in that? particular parasite, I believe, 
if I'm correct, that the upregulation of heme oxygenase one is uh, inhibitory towards the parasite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it actually, and it is interesting, right? Because you know everything ties together because we've, I think, we've lived with these organisms so long. So there, they're actually suggesting it influences iron metabolism, right? And okay. A lot of organisms, okay. you know, so the iron itself, not just hemoglobin, um, but also. Um, Heme oxygenase one is tied very intimately with macrophage function, with immune right. function. Of course. Of um, course. So that may be part of this as well. So, you know, maybe plasmodium is exploiting this. Maybe other, you know, protozoan pathogens are actually being impacted by this. So. Right. Well, you can't say that T. cruzi suffers too much from this, though, because it's a long-term chronic disease that eventually kills the host 20 yeah. years later after it gets inside their heart muscle or uh, small, large intestine. So, so, so for Chagas, the HO decreases parasite loads, right? Yeah, or it controls the growth of the parasite once it's inside certain cells. And I'm sure it's not all cells. It could be heart tissue, which has a, a very high need for this probably, and uh, maybe spleen cells, which, which mm-hmm. uh, break down hemoglobin. Okay. Now you got two other parasites to deal with, though. You've got Toxoplasma gondii, mm-hmm. and you've got Leishmania. All right. So what are the, what's this HO doing with those? So let's <laughs> – well, he's got wonderful graphics in this paper, and I haven't got them pushed up on my screen, but I'm sure you do. Yeah. And as you can see, uh, in each of the other two cases, I believe that Toxoplasma gondii – actually does better with an upregulated uh, heme oxygenase one. And I don't remember, I can't commit this to memory, but. Uh, yeah. For the Leishmania, the increased um, RRO, yes. HO1, sorry. HO1, right. That's okay. Um, decreases um, resistance to the, the parasite, and this is in macrophages. This, this, so it lets it grow better. Yeah, that's a so grow it favors better. Favors the macrophages, parasite. Yeah. Phases, phases the- Higher HO activity, HO1, favors parasite growth in macrophages, right. and low activity decreases parasite growth. Yeah. And what does they say about the Toxoplasma gondii? Uh, toxoplasma um, is a host factor that increases both resistance and disease tolerance to infection. <laughs> Depending on the host, probably. A lot of these experiments were done in mice. Um, so maybe mouse H01 is a little bit different in its function. They say that uh, H01 is a candidate, induction of H01 might be a candidate therapeutic ap- approach to treat patients with toxoplasmosis. Right, right. But, um, they're, they're but it's both, an inducible disease. It's an inducible enzyme, I should yeah, say. Yeah, That's but all. You know, it may have other effects if you induce it. So, Right. So That's maybe true. the HO2 which we don't talk about, is the constituent of enzyme that plays the role in recycling heme and, and uh, iron uh, after red cell breakdown. Because mm. that's, you know, obviously we have a, a need for a very high uh, turnover rate for this. Um, mm-hmm. And so therefore, I think that uh, I, I was attracted to the article because without doing a single experiment, they uh, surveyed the literature and came up with a very interesting hypothesis. Yeah, it's, it's nice diagrams also if you... Yeah, yeah, very easy to, to understand uh, and... If you need to and teach And clear-cut this. differences, clear-cut differences. Yeah. Uh, you'd ex- you wouldn't expect all intracellular uh, protozoans to behave similarly, but because they all get in differently and they all live in different portions of the, the uh, intracellular milieu, mm-hmm. uh, particularly for, for T. Tika- uh, T. cruzi. T. cruzi is a sneaky parasite because it doesn't live in a parasitophorous vacuole inside the cell. It lives in the naked cytoplasm of the cell. It's absolutely surrounded by rough ER and other uh, organelles that the host has, but it, it just, there's no membrane that contains it. And so it's a hard parasite to attack because it assumes the role of an intracellular uh, subcellular particle, yeah. basically. So uh, it's, 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 they're all different biologies and yet uh, fascinating. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this develops over time. It was just in this last issue of Plus Pathogens. All right. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, you're welcome, Vincent. Now, I believe um, you have a, a hero for us, right? I do. I do. And I can tell you the origin of this hero, and I'll give you his name first, is Satu Yamaguti. 
Satu Yamaguchi is Japanese by birth, and I'm reading from his Wikipedia page. Um, and uh, he was born in 1894 and lived until 1986. Now, can you imagine what this man's life was like living through the First World War and then the Second World War? Mm -hmm. And especially if you live in Japan, uh, his life must have been absolutely horrendous at some points. But yet he became a world expert at classification of parasites. And that's how I got to know him because when I was a graduate student at Columbia going for my master's degree, uh, one of the requirements was that we spend some time at the Michigan Biological Station in Pelston, Michigan. That station is still up and running. Uh, I hope they're doing okay because of this uh, lockdown. But um, part of the course that I took, I took one course in protozoology or protozoan biology, and the other course was in helminthology. The helminthology course was fascinating because where the heck are you going to get your specimens from? So, you know, you can't just go out and start killing animals and looking in their gut tracts for parasites. So it wasn't difficult to find hosts hmm. because all you had to do was get in your car and drive along the highway. And you could find an, any number of two-dimensional wildlife uh, scattered along. You could find deer, raccoons, skunks, uh, ra uh, porcupines, stray dogs. And we used to call this course Post a Host. Because posting a host meant that you found a host, you brought it back to the lab, you shared it with the other students. There were eight of us in this class. And some people got the brains, and some people got the large intestine, and some people got the lungs. And it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I can only tell you that at one point in this course, I ended up clearing the room because I wrote, I, I, I came back into class you know, with something in a large plastic bag that had been tied off. And I said, I found this along the road, and I'm sure it's going to offer us a lot of interesting looks. And it was a fully mature female skunk in full bloom, I must say. Also, right. And everybody just, no, we're not touching this. We're not getting near it. And fortunately, the scent sack had not been broken. Ah. So the smell was reduced. Wow. Right wow. I found a lot of good parasites that way. And anyway, to find out which parasites you had, you, so you consulted these large beautifully illustrated um, tomes that this gentleman, uh, Yamaguchi, had put together. Hmm. And he, he had about three very large, voluminous books with copious pictures. They're beautifully illustrated. He was a magnificent artist. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but the emperor of Japan uh, was noted for his artistry. He used to paint hmm. and do sketches and... Um, his favorites were land crabs. Hmm. Uh, this guy was amazing in the detail that he could put into a drawing. And it was all done by stippling, you know, no line drawings at all. It's all done by stippling and shading with stipples. And, you know, the, the keys that were invented, uh, testes over intestines, uh, malus gland, this malus, it, it forced you to learn the anatomy of all these wonderful critters. And then you found the pictures that corresponded to the end in their classification. And then you got graded on this, of course. <laughs> you got to make the slides. You had to hand it in at the end of the year. I think I ended up with like an 89 or something like this as a, a final grade because I had very, I had a very difficult time once you got to the actual species of this parasite as to which direction you went in. And they were all dichotomous keys, yes or no, this or that, big or small, yellow or green, that, that sort of thing. And, yeah. and this is the gentleman. This is the gentleman right here that mm -hmm. that cemented my relationship with, uh, I guess, the parasitic wildlife of uh, northern road Michigan. Kill, Roadkill parasites. Roadkill. <laughs> By the way, the one the one host that we had that everyone thought would have huge numbers of parasites turned out to be the one that had almost no parasites, and that were crows. Hmm. The crow had almost no parasitic infections. They had one mosquito-borne filarial worm. And everybody says, well, what's going on? They eat roadkill, don't they? And the instructor said, no, they're not actually eating the roadkill. Look very carefully at what they're doing. They're picking out the contents of the stomach of the killed animal. Hmm. So there's very little 
in the way of transmission that that could actually fall into, you know, patterns of parasitemia. So oh, I love this guy. He was just great with his drawings and everything. And so I, I think he's worthy of being installed as the one of our heroes. You have some interesting stories there, Dixon. Well, uh, you should have met these guys that were running this course. They were absolutely wonderful. People. I'm sure, I'm sure they and were. They, they had stories. They, you know, you you didn't want to go back for dinner. You wanted to just stay in the lab and listen to some, <laughs> to how they found their calling in yeah, this sure. field. One guy was his name is Dr. Wooten, and he was from Chico State University. I remember this distinctly. And the other guy was Hendricks. Uh, from the University of North Carolina, and one was a helminthologist, and the other, or, yeah, one was a nematologist, and the other one was a, a trematologist. Hmm. And they were wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. All right, that's very, great. very good great story. Experience. Roadkill yeah. of Northern Michigan. That's right. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> actually, it was the if you if you ask somebody from Michigan where they're from, they'll put their hand up and they'll point to like this is Saginaw Bay. And yeah. if you want to know where Pelston is, it's right at the tip of your middle finger. It's in the southern peninsula, or the, yeah, the southern portion of Michigan, right at the tip, so that you can essentially sample water. We did this in our our protozoan course. We sampled water from three Great Lakes in one day. You know where Kathy Spindler's from, right? Where is she from? Where she's from? Southeastern Michigan. Well, that's where she lives now. She's not from there. Southeastern. Right. Right. All right. That Thank was you. fantastic. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, you're welcome, Vincent. Daniel, have you got another case or you finished? I do, but I was just <laughs> I was just thinking the next time I am quote unquote eating crow, I will be able to uh harass my uh, son by by explaining to him that it's really not so bad because these carrion eaters have that's right, so that's few right. parasites. Exactly right. <laughs> so it's okay to eat crow. <laughs> so yes, I do. Um, all right. So this is a uh, pregnant, newly married woman. She's living on the North Shore of Long Island and she's having her first pregnancy. Um, she comes from an affluent North Shore Long Island family. Um, and she just recently married a successful lawyer who loves to cook and throw dinner parties. Uh, the woman's very focused on doing natural things, only eats organic foods, lots of fresh organic vegetables. Um, and at nine months of age, uh, a baby boy was born. Uh, now, the woman has a midwife. Um, she has the delivery at home. She um, hasn't engaged in OB um, up until this point. Um, but the baby is noticed initially to have an enlarged head. And at this point, she takes them to see an obstetrician, and the baby is diagnosed with hydrocephalus. Um, as mentioned, the, the, the mother is very healthy, um, no past medical, no surgical issues, no allergies, um, nothing in the family that we're aware of. Um, she doesn't take any medications. Um, as far as the social history, um, she works in a retail store. Um, she lives with her, her new husband, and actually she hasn't been working for the, for the second half of the pregnancy. She's been mostly in the home. Um, she um, drank um, alcohol rarely and only socially prior to the pregnancy, but nothing during the pregnancy. Um, no significant travel um, other than just right in the immediate North Shore, Long Island area. Um, and then exposure history. So the patient um, reports um, having no pets, um, but her brother, who she visits quite often, owns a small farm with chickens, rabbits, um, lots of different crops. Um, and of note, she uh, when we go into the history, the husband um, is big into serving very rare meats at these um, big dinner parties. All right. So I... No, I feel like no, that's probably no, uh, no cats around, huh? No cats around. I mean, well, you know, there, there. She doesn't have any cats, right? But she's, you know, at the brother's farm, etc. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. What kind of meat uh, does he like to cook? All kinds. That actually tends to be a big part of these dinner parties: is all these different meats that are are um, served up. And does she like to eat the the rare meats? Um, she she had not really eaten rare meat much before, but now that um, she is married, before this she she did not eat a lot of meat, but now that she's married and um, all these dinner parties, uh, she's been eating rare meats for really the first time. Hmm. Mm. 
All right. <laughs> I have no All questions. Right. <laughs> did you have did you have any more questions, uh, Dixon? I don't have any questions. Okay. He, he knows the answer. Well, I think I know the answer, but that's I may not be true. Hmm. And so we're going to, we're going to do some diagnostic tests. We're going to do an ultrasound. Yep. Um, we're going to do a, a, a CT um, and we're going to do some blood work on the mother and the baby. Indeed. Dick, Daniel, why were you uh, brought into this? Um, I, I get brought in like all the time when there's a thought that there might be an infectious uh, process involved. So okay. that's how I get involved. All right. Very good. There you go. That's TWIP. 187. We have a lot of emails accumulated. Maybe next time we could skip a paper and just plow through these emails. What do you That'd think? That, that I think we fun. need to do that. It looks like we've got quite a bit of a backlog. Yeah, there, so. yeah we, we should read them. Some good ones there. All good ones, of course. All right. So that is TWIP 187. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIP. There you'll find all the show notes, the case guesses, uh, the new case, you know, typed out if you want to see it. Uh, and uh, if you have a guess, if you want to ask a question, twip at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially at microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University Irving Medical College, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. I was going to say thank you, but I was also going to say thank you to everyone who keeps going to Parasites Without Borders and donating to help us support floating doctors, right? We're still yep. doing our, our floating doctors um, support for August and September so we can help them um, support all the individuals, um, you know, down in these, these tough times. So thank you. Always a pleasure. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. This was, as usual, entertaining and fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins. And I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. It is, is parasitic. parasitic.